formal story about a circle of ideas I was working on for the last 20 years. And um, this will be a, a popular talk, but of course addressed to, 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 to physicists, right? So people who uh, uh, know how to calculate integrals and, and things like that, right? So, but uh, again, so if, if something is not clear, so please try to uh, interrupt me and, and uh, stop me and ask. All right, so, so the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the plan of our activity is here. Uh, we will talk first of all about uh, black holes, right? I will remind you what black holes are and uh, how they are embedded in, uh, in the framework uh, of modern string theory, in particular uh, from a point of view of uh, attempts to explain black holes entropy. Uh, because uh, explanations, attempts to explain black hole entropy led to something which is known as ads CFT correspondence in string theory and uh, also known as holography. And that was a rather exciting and uh, rather strong development of the last 20, 25 years. So that, that will be the main subject of our discussion. So we'll talk about perturbative and non-perturbative approaches to calculation and I will give you some very simple example. And then we'll come to this ads CFT correspondence, but first I will again illustrate this with a simple example of what we, what we call the duality between one description and another description of one and the same system. All right. Then we'll talk about this holographic duality in some detail, and then finally come to applications. And applications will be related to physics of heavy ion collisions and something which is known as quark gluon plasma. Now, um, uh, uh, then uh, I will try to convince you that string theory provides at least indirectly some ways to, uh, to help to understand this behavior of real systems of this quark gluon plasma in heavy ion collisions. So, um, um, uh, uh, let me remind you uh, that uh, in, in the modern theory of classical gravity, which is Einstein's theory of uh, relativity, of general relativity, uh, we have a, a rather complicated relation between the metric of space-time, the geometry of space-time, and energy and matter embedded in this, in this geometry. And this relationship is encoded in Einstein's uh, uh, equations of general relativity. So I remind you that we don't have at the moment a, a consistent theory of quantum gravity, but on a classical level, we know what is going on. And this has been very successfully tested for, uh, for, for about a hundred years. And um, these uh, equations written here, so on the left-hand side, you have various uh, quantities related to geometry starting from the metric of space-time G mu and then uh, Ricci tensor. And then I included also cosmological constant lambda because nowadays we cannot live without it. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have energy and mass encoded in the relativistic way in the object, which is known as the energy momentum tensor. So basically this equation tells you that if you put some mass or energy, because in special relativity, of course, mass and energy can you know, it can be, can be interchanged with various relativistic processes. So if you have some mass or energy in the universe, this mass and energy will source the change in the fabric of space-time, in the metric of space-time. And the fabric of space-time is encoded in the left-hand side. And basically you have to solve these equations to tell what the metric of space-time will be if you put a particular distribution of masses and energy in space. And this is philosophically similar to what you do with Maxwell's equations, right? When you have on the right-hand side of Maxwell's equations, you have uh, charges and currents, and then you want to find the electric and magnetic field by solving Maxwell's equations, right? So this is philosophically, this uh, Einstein's equations is similar. Of course, technically speaking, it's much different from Maxwell because Maxwell's equations are linear. And strictly speaking, we know solution for uh, every distribution of, of, of uh, uh, charges and, um, and currents. And uh, whereas Einstein's equations are horribly nonlinear partial differential equations and common solution, general solution is completely unknown. Nonetheless, some of the solutions are known. And uh, one of the best known solutions of Einstein's equations, the exact solution, uh, was found almost immediately after publication of, um, of uh, Einstein's uh, uh, paper uh, by Karl Schwarzschild, and it is known as Schwarzschild metric. So it describes the space-time, the metric of space-time outside of the body of mass M. So if you look at this line element of this metric, 
and put M to zero with capital M to zero, you will see that this bracket here reduces to one and this bracket here downstairs reduces to one, right? And you are back to the standard uh, flat Minkowski space time, right? So this is um, the presence of mass will distort it from this, from being flat, uh, flat, uh, flat space time. So, okay, so it's important to realize that this metric applies only to objects out to space time outside of the spherically symmetric distribution of mass, not inside. So if you take, for example, uh, yeah, so you also may notice that in this metric, there is a special value of R where this whole bracket vanishes and this uh, bracket vanishes and you have singularity in the metric. So this is known as the Schwarzschild uh, radius. And uh, uh, one thing to realize, and sometimes it's not realized, is that, um, uh, so if you take an ordinary body, a spherical symmetric body, so for example, take an Earth, right? The Earth can be approximated, of course, it's an approximation, but still it's a pretty good approximation. It can be approximated by a ball of mass M, right? Then the metric outside of, the, of this ball will be described by Schwarzschild, but not inside, not inside. So if you ask what about the Schwarzschild radius for, for the Earth, you discover that in the plug-in numbers, right? You will discover that it is about one centimeter. So it's deep down below, right? It's, it's very small in comparison to Earth size. And inside the Earth, this metric doesn't apply. So we, we couldn't care less about the singularity. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't show up there, right? So that, 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 that is completely harmless. It doesn't, it's not harmless if you happen to squeeze. So suppose by some powerful forces, you take this ball, for example, the Earth, and squeeze it into the dimension which is smaller than the Schwarzschild radius, right? So it's it's a pretty difficult thing to do, right? Imagine the whole Earth squeezed in a ball of radius one centimeter, right? So, the, but we do have forces in nature, for example, gravity, which in gravitational collapse of stars does does precisely that. It squeezes giant bodies into rather small objects, right? So Schwarzschild radius for Sun, for example, is about three kilometers, right? So. So you can understand how, yeah. So then if that happens, then of course this singularity matters. And then the object becomes a black hole and this singularity becomes a physical, a physical uh, um, a location of a physical um, uh, phenomenon, which is known as event horizon. Uh, uh, so event horizon is uh, something that, that, that is char characteristic of, of black holes. So, <coughs> so here is basically the picture of what I said, right? So, um, so you have event horizon. So one, one important thing to realize that um, um, uh, it's not a real singularity, it's called the coordinate singularity in the sense that, um, yes, the metric is singular, but the metric itself is a tensor. So you can change, uh, make a change of variables and go to a different description. It's similar to, for example, when you have polar coordinates, right? So suppose you have two dimensional space time and you can write the metric as dx squared plus dy squared, right? Uh, but you can write the same metric in polar coordinates and then you have dr squared plus r squared d, d phi squared, right? And in this case, r equals zero is a singularity because there is something which will be equal to zero in front of d phi squared, right? But of course, space time is completely regular at the origin, right? So it's just a question of, uh, of, of making a coordinate, change of coordinates and, and going to the right, uh, to the right coordinates uh, so that the singularity doesn't show up. So this is the case with a Schwarzschild metric. However, uh, the, the event horizon has another property, right? So it's not a singular point in some, in, in a coordinate sense because you can change coordinates, but it is a special point because uh, if you happen to be behind the event horizon, then nothing can escape to outside, right? So no uh, object moving even with the speed of light is capable of escaping to, to outside world. So, so this is a, if you want, it's, a, it's an imaginary boundary between, uh, between the enclosed space from which you cannot escape and the rest of the universe, right? So in that sense, it is a real physical, uh, it is a real physical, uh, 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 physical distance. All right. So uh, I would like to mention simply uh, for uh, people who look at the boundaries of kind of modern theoretical physics that, that yeah, we don't have theory of quantum gravity. We can, however, consider classical corrections to, uh, to Einstein's theory of, of, of gravity, right? And this is important to realize, and this is something which is, uh, which is, uh, which has been done uh, in, in uh, recent years all the time. So let me write down the Lagrangian or the action for, um, 
uh, classical gravity again so there's no nothing quantum is going on here so classical gravity the the traditional einstein hilbert classical gravity contains in the lagrangian two terms one of them is the scalar r and then there is also cosmological constant lambda but uh, nothing prevents you from writing down higher derivative terms, the infinite series of higher derivative terms in the action. So in fact, the modern view of quantum of, of field theory in general uh, is that you have to write these terms. All of them are allowed by symmetries of, of, your, uh, of your theory. And then you have to explain why the coefficients, for example, C1, C2, and so on, there are infinitely many of them, are happen to be, happen to be small because if they were not small, we would see strong deviations from Einstein's Hilbert theory of relativity. We don't see it in, in experiments like uh, deflection of light or things like that, right? But uh, so this means simply that these terms uh, perhaps are there and most likely they're there, but the coefficients in front of them are incredibly small, all right? So uh, one lesson to kind of to, uh, uh, to, to keep in mind here is that uh, gravity is viewed uh, currently as an effective theory, which is valid at sufficiently large distances and times. And this is similar to hydrodynamics in some sense, right? Because if you look at hydrodynamics, you have Navier-Stokes equations, right? But Navier-Stokes equations, just like Einstein's equations, they apply at some scales, which are much larger than microscopic scales of uh, water molecules, right? And if you want to, uh, improve, let's say, to, to, to write down corrections to your Navier stocks, which would take into account these deviations from this uh, long, uh, long wavelength limit, then there will be an infinite series known as derivative expansion, which would come closer and closer and closer to microscopic description of water in terms of molecules, atoms, and so on, right? So uh, nobody knows in, 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 in the case of gravity, what this microscopic uh, grain, right? So, what is what is the structure of space-time on the microscopic distances, right? And and uh, string theory offers one option, but it's not experimentally confirmed, right? So we don't we don't know for sure. But at least string theory offers a way to compute this coefficient c1, c2, and so on. And so so one one kind of remark about quantum gravity, and I think that. So uh, let me just also mention that in addition to Schwarzschild uh, uh, metrics, uh, Schwarzschild black holes. You, you can have more complicated black holes, which are, for example, charged. So you can have mass, right? Mass M in the metric, but also charge. And then it's known as a Reisner Nordstrom black hole. The metric is also exactly known. Here it is, right? And then on top of that, you can also add some angular momentum. So you have a, a black hole which has a mass, it has charge. And it also, it, it is rotating, for example, with angular velocity omega, right? In this case, metric is also exactly known, is uh, known as a Kerr Newman metric, but it's slightly more complicated to put on this slide, but just be aware that, that this, is, uh, this is known analytically. And it's a rare situation when you have analytic solution to, uh, to equations of motion, in this case, Einstein's equations of motion. So black holes have very interesting properties. Uh, one of them is um, uh, the property of, the, of having an entropy associated with a black hole. And the entropy uh, is, was proposed by, so it was proposed by Bekenstein uh, in 1972 that uh, black holes must have entropy which are proportional to the horizon area. And at the time it was, uh, uh, he, he had a really hard time uh, kind of promoting this point of view because of course people say, well, what's the entropy of black hole, right? Where is the temperature? It's not a thermodynamic equilibrium. What is this and so on, right? So, and then uh, until Hawking, so in 74, Hawking demonstrated that black hole actually do have temperature. They radiate, they emit radiation at a quantum level and one has to, uh, one, one, one can associate a temperature with black holes, right? And then people didn't laugh anymore, right? So they started seeing this as a rather serious business. So uh, Hawking demonstrated that black holes emit radiation with uh, uh, a black body spectrum at a temperature, which for Schwarzschild black holes is inversely proportional to mass and is proportional to H bar, right? So the temperature is actually tiny in kind of a normal, in normal uh, language, right? Uh, for example, a black hole of one solar mass would have a Hawking temperature of about 50 nano Kelvin. So clearly forget about detecting this with, uh, you know, you have many, many astrophysical uh, phenomena, accretion disks and so on. So clearly this is not something you can detect. However, 
it has a, in Bekenstein Hockey entropy, which is proportional to the horizon area, h bar goes into denominator, and uh, entropy of black hole is actually gigantic. So uh, you can view this. Uh, so in some sense, you may you may think of the universe evolving, right? So most stars become well, some stars, well, significant kind of fraction of stars will become black holes ultimately, right? Then these black holes in some point, if you wait for eternity, right? They will merge in giant black holes and so on. And all these uh, guys will be uh, will accumulate entropy in gigantic quantities, right? So you may think of the fate of the universe as a depository, right? With the cemetery, the cemetery of these black holes, right? With deposit, a huge deposit of entropy, right? So that's, that's rather, <coughs> so, so this creates um, immediate consequences and various problems, right? So, because uh, Hawking demonstrated that black holes evaporate with time, right? And that immediately leads to, uh, 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 and they evaporate as black bodies, right? So, so this means that there is no information. So somehow they, they de the depositor of this, of this, um, uh, of this entropy, but but then they evaporate and they leave black body radiation, which carries no information whatsoever about the specifics of the stuff. So suppose uh, you throw some books into black hole, right? Some, your favorite novel, right? And then this information is completely lost because what comes out is a black body radiation, which carries no information apart from the black body spectrum, right? So, so, so this is known as information loss paradox and people were trying to kind of, you know, break their heads and, you know, uh, right, for, for a long time to trying to resolve it. But uh, let's, uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk about this paradox uh, here. I will talk about another thing. So when you have something, so suppose you have entropy, suppose if you have an object which has a temperature and entropy and behaves thermodynamically, right? So I want to mention also that uh, it's not just temperature and entropy. Actually, uh, they discovered it in 1970s that uh, black hole mechanics, the laws of black hole mechanics are one-to-one -one in correspondence and one-to-one -one correspondence with the ordinary laws of thermodynamics. So you can identify the zero flow, first law, second law, and third law of thermodynamics um, of, of black holes, right? And then, uh, and then you see, okay, so you have some object which behaves as a thermodynamic system, all right? Normally, once we have thermodynamics, we ask a question, what are the microscopic degrees of freedom underlying this thermodynamic behavior, right? Because we know that there is a statistical physics a statistical physics with uh, Maxwell Boltzmann distribution of Fermi Dirac or whatever, right? Would tell us that we can derive thermodynamics from the microscopic of statistical physics, right? From microscopic degrees of freedom doing various things, right? So a natural question to ask is what are these degrees of freedom in case of black holes if they behave as thermodynamic systems, right? So this is a major question in 19, 1970s, 80s and 90s and um, it still uh, doesn't have a full explanation, but there is a partial explanation. I will mention this. So let me just, uh, so this is a slide about this entropy and mi microstates, right? So, so in statistical physics, um, entropy is related to the number of microstates, right? So remember this famous Boltzmann uh, equation, which is uh, also engraved on his tombstone, right? So that's uh, like Feynman once mentioned that we all have to inspire that something like this or something similar would be engraved in our tombstones, right? Uh, he was talking about uh, Atwood, I think, uh, but not uh, Boltzmann. But Boltzmann also has his, uh, this equation on his tombstone. Anyway, so, so entropy is proportional to the logarithm of the number of microstates, right? So suppose you have a simple system uh, such as one particle with a spin, right? It has two microstates up and down, right? So that's, uh, now, suppose you have now two particles with a spin, the number of possible microstates is four. Right, and n particles of spin will have two to power n microstates, possible possible orientations of spin. So Boltzmann entropy in this case would be simply proportional to n, right? And then there is this log two, which is a numerical coefficient. All right. So a simple question is: if we have black hole uh, whose entropy is proportional to the horizon area, can we count the microstates of a black hole and recover this result? So we have to identify those microstates first and then count them and uh, compare with this proposal of Bekenstein and see, because remember it was a one quarter of the horizon area. So we have to recover this result. So is there a theory which would allow us to do this, this count and, and get the right answer, right? So that, that's a question to ask. So um, uh, this, uh, this theory actually, uh, such a theory exists. Right, so um, in uh, 1996, Strominger and Waffer 
uh, managed to count the microstates of a very special, I must say, not Schwarzschild black hole in our universe, which is unfortunate, but a very special type of black hole in five dimensions. And um, uh, this result coincides exactly with the Bekenstein Hawking entropy, uh, thermodynamic entropy, right? So uh, this has been generalized ever since, but uh, it's important uh, uh, to understand that uh, this tells us that at least, so string theory may or may not be theory of nature, does you know it, but at least it allows uh, this derivation, exact derivation, analytical derivation of Bekenstein Hawking result, at least in, in this simplified version where you can control your calculation very well in five dimensions and so on. So that, uh, that, 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 was, uh, that was an interesting development. Now let's come to the holographic principle. So this uh, uh, formula of Bekenstein and Hawking uh, is very curious, right? It tells us that the entropy is proportional to the area of the horizon not the volume of black hole, right? If you take uh, formulas uh, of ideal gas, I mean, something you, you, you calculated yourself many times, right? Then the entropy actually is extensive quantity. It's always proportional to a volume, a three-dimensional volume of visit. But if gravity is involved, this is no longer the case, no longer the case, right? So you have a very strange situation in which the entropy of the gravitating object is proportional to something which is one direction, one, dim one dimension less, right? So there is a relationship between uh, between a dimension which is one uh, uh, one uh, um, one unit less than the uh, dimension of the object itself, and this is a manifestation of the so-called gravitational principle, which was put forward by Tropton and Susskind in 1992, mostly in this kind of semi-philosophical uh, way, if you want, right? But uh, they just declared that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, um, a feature of gravity in general, that uh, if you have gravitational degrees of freedom in D dimensions, they has to be effectively described by a certain non-gravitational theory in dimension D minus one. And this formula is a reflection of this, of this principle. So that was philosophy, right? And uh, then, um, um, uh, in fact, uh, so this counting of Trominger and Waffa of microstates uh, and the reproducing of uh, bekenstein hawking entropy was a confirmation of the holographic principle, at least in this specific, specific case. So you have some system, the microstates live in higher dimension, but uh, you can actually, uh, so, uh, sorry, the black hole lives in higher dimension, but you can actually uh, count the, 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 the microstates in lower dimension and reproduce this, uh, reproduce this. All right, so um, then, um, I'm sorry, I think I'm going back. Yes, so, so here is a slide. So we're coming to uh, the so-called holographic duality. So holographic duality. So before uh, going to a technical slide, so let me just mention this uh, picture, which was used extensively in several years. I, I have stolen this from Shamit Kashru, one of the leading theoretical th uh, string theorists. Uh, who gave a talk several years ago in New York, and I, I liked it very much. So this is a picture due to uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein, a famous philosopher and rather uh, interesting character. If you never encountered, encountered uh, his name or work, I, I strongly you know, advise you to, uh, to, to, to read about him and, and what, whatever he wrote. So in 1953, he, in um, one of his philosophical uh, uh, treatises, he, 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 he he discussed this picture, which actually the picture was published in some German newspaper in, in, at the end of 19th century, but, but he put a kind of this philosophical spin on this, right? So, so suppose we have an object and we want to say, we want to describe and tell what this object is. So looking at this object, uh, let's say vertically, normally, so to speak, right? We kind of see a picture of a duck, right? And therefore we describe this object as a duck, right? But if you tilt your head like this, right? So then, then yes then you suddenly discover that this picture is actually not a duck at all, right? It's a rabbit, right? A very cute rabbit, right? So you definitely describe from this point of view, you describe this object as a rabbit, right? But the, the object, right, is neither rabbit or duck, right? It's an object, right? It's, it's, it's something which exists independently of how you put this coordinate system, right? And, and how you describe it. So it means that there should be a dictionary between the language in which this object looks like a rabbit to a dictionary in which this object looks like a duck, right? And this dictionary better be one-to-one, -one, right? Because the object is one and the same. So the moral of the story is that duality, right? Is this dictionary 
between two descriptions of one and the same object, whatever this object is, right? Now in string theory, why I'm going keep coming, yeah. In string theory, what happens is that uh, you have certain non-perturbative solitonic-like solutions of string theory, which are called uh, D-brains, right? I don't even want to go into it, it doesn't really matter. So there are some, you think of them as solitons of some equations of motion, right? Now, these solitonic uh, objects can be described in two languages, in the language of open string picture, in which they appear as just hypersurfaces with some excitations of gauge fields on them. Or you can describe the same object in the language of closed string theory and closed string picture. And in closed string picture, you have uh, the same object is described uh, with uh, degrees of freedom, which involve uh, gravity. In particular, they involve black holes and things like that in higher dimension. This is important. So you, uh, again, you, you form a dictionary if you manage to write down a one-to-one -one correspondence, a dictionary between two descriptions, but you are describing one of the same object in this language of rabbit or duck, right? So that's, that's the idea. And uh, unlike Wittgenstein, right? So it's not philosophy anymore. Uh, it is actually quantitative correspondence. So it means that if you're thinking of the um, of description in open string picture, you have a theory and the theory has a partition function, right? The correlation function, so any other quantitative descriptions, which in principle you can compute, right? So this theory has no gravitational degrees of freedom. And you have a dictionary which allows you to rewrite this expression, this partition function in the language of the closed string theory, which will contain these gravitational degrees of freedom. But this is just a change of variables in your path, uh, Feynman path integral. All right, so it is a quantitative dictionary. And the beauty of this is that one description is valid at strong coupling, when you have a, a strongly coupled uh, uh, quantum field theory uh, uh, to, to work with, and usually it's very difficult to work with and almost impossible. But if you have strongly coupled description on one side, the other side, the dual description is weakly coupled. And everybody knows how to calculate in weakly coupled, you do perturbation theory, so that is just a technical matter, all right? So this is the beauty of duality that whenever you have problems with strong coupled uh, description of strongly coupled system, you just do the dictionary into a weakly coupled uh, part of the, of the duality and you calculate on that side, okay? So this is why people were so uh, excited about, uh, about this. So uh, let, me, let me just give you, uh, uh, sorry, that's not an well, example of if you want a, a, uh, another kind of uh, incentive, uh, maybe more aimed to, 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 to physicists, right? And the kind of general audience that um, uh, of course, one way to define a quantum theory is to use Feynman path integral, right? And uh, uh, we know how, how it goes, right? So usually you have partition function, which is the um, uh, integral over a, a particular fields, for example, gauge fields or scalar fields, doesn't matter, whatever fields you have in the theory, over the exponent which contains the action S of the theory, right? And some parameter, uh, uh, so this parameter uh, I denoted by alpha, for example, could be coupling constant, it could be a uh, number of colors, uh, some, some parameter of the theory. Now, um, the important thing is that you integrate over the fields. So the partition function depends on the parameters of the theory, but not on the fields themselves, right? And the integration over the fields Right, so is uh, something where you, these fields are regarded as dummy variable, just like in usual integral, right? To integrate over X, but no, if you find it more convenient to make a change of variable integrated over Y, which is kind of, there is a clever change of variable which simplifies your integral, of course you do it, right? So here is the same story. You integrate over some fields, but they're not secret in any way, right? You can, um, uh, you can even solve the theory completely if you manage to do a clever change of variables, which uh, reduces this integral to a, to a trivial Gaussian, for example, integral, right? So that's, that's the, 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 the idea of duality, if you want, is to find a clever change of variables, which trivializes, which simplifies your, your integral, all right? Now, um, uh, uh, let, me, um, uh, let me give you a, a very simple toy model of, uh, of, of this situation, right? So suppose you have a, 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 to calculate a, a, a highly non-trivial 
integral over x from zero to one, right, of the square root, uh, one minus alpha squared x squared, right? Well, and just imagine, of course, you know how to calculate it exactly, right? But, but suppose, let's pretend we don't, right? So let's pretend that we just learned about integration. Now here you have parameter, which is alpha and uh, integration variable x is a dummy variable, right? So you integrate over x. So you can change your variables, right? From x to any other variable and simplify your integral if you're clever enough, right? So let's see if it is possible. Now, one way to proceed, so suppose you, you, you're not clever, right? So you don't know how to do it. What can you do? And this is a situation uh, quantum field theorists find themselves all the time, right? They, they simply don't know how to change variables, right? Uh, so what can you do? Well, one thing is to use perturbation theory, right? So, okay, for alpha, if alpha is very small, right? What you can do, you can expand the square root in series, right, for small alpha. And uh, the expansion will tell you that the series will start with one and then there is plus some small correction. Right, so you know how to take integral of one, right? It's equal to x. Very good, right? And and uh, and moreover, integral from zero to one of of dx is equal to one, right? So uh, that's a great success. So prediction for very small alpha, even if you don't know anything else about integrals, but prediction that for very small alpha, your z reduces to one, right? Okay, and you can continue this term by term, right? In principle, so. Um, so let's look at the exact plot, right? So of course we know the exact answer, but let's plot it exactly, right? So this is our exact answer for Z. And this is our perturbative approximation, right? Which is, yes, it's not so bad as long as you're not very far from zero, but clearly in this region already, it deviates quite significantly. So <clears throat> suppose we want to know Z for any alpha. <coughs> well, you can do a change of variables so you can notice that uh, one minus alpha squared uh, uh, x squared can be, you know, we can use trigonometric substitution like this, right? So this re uh, uh, resembles this uh, trigonometric uh, uh, equality. And uh, it's natural to make a change of variables from x to y, such as alpha x equal to sine y, right? Then there is a square root and then the square root of cosine squared is cosine. So that's, that's very simple, right? So then alpha dx is cosine y dy and your integral reduces to a trivial integral that you know how to take the integral of one dy, right? And, and the answer is immediate. So the, the exact answer is arc sine alpha divided by alpha. All right, so that, that's, uh, that's an example. So, so you can either approach it by perturbative theory, right? But this has limitations or you can try to make this non-trivial change of variables, i.e. duality go to dual description and dual description reduces the situation to a trivial one to perturbative situation, okay? So this is, uh, this is the, uh, the example of duality. So this is exactly what ADS CFT correspondence was, right? So people found, if you want, um, um, admittedly they, did they found it only for a limited class of theories. It's not something that is completely universal in the sense that if you come to me with your favorite Lagrangian or with your favorite uh, theory and, 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 and ask, okay, do your change, do your magic of change of variables and give me the simple answer, right? I, 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 will, not be able to, I will not be able to do it. I will be able to do it only for a very uh, narrow, but not too narrow, a certain class of, of Lagrangians, a certain class of theories, right? But it is still valuable because this gives us a window uh, an access to a completely non-perturbative physics, and this is uh, this is uh, this is rare in, in general. So that's, uh, yeah. All right. So <clears throat> now, uh, so using this duality, we can uh, find various quantities in quantum field theory at strong coupling, right? By doing the actual computation and dual string theory at weak coupling, right? By doing this uh, perturbative calculation on the right-hand side of the rabbit to duck language, and um, um, for some quantities, this is the only non-perturbative tool in physics we have available at, at, at this time, right? So for example, if you want to compute transport coefficients such as uh, viscosities and so on, there is no way you can put it on lattice in QCD because it's real time processes, you cannot compute them. So um, note also that this duality is completely independent of the status of string theory as the theory of nature, right? So we don't care, I mean, I. Uh, this may be a theory of nature or this may be a mathematical curiosity, right? A mathematical model, but the duality is a mathematical property of the theory itself, right? So it works regardless of uh, what, what happens to nature, uh, to status as a theory of nature. 
All right. So now uh, let me come to the um, uh, to the um, uh, heavy ion collisions, right? So application. So this, uh, I mean, you may view this, of course, as a purely theoretical abstract exercise, right? Of, of doing various dualities and computing various quantities, which has absolutely nothing to do with uh, with nature, and, and then yeah. But it's not entirely true. I, I want to convince you that, that something interesting really uh, came out of this uh, of this duality, and and. Um, uh, this is something related to heavy ion collisions, right? So, so heavy ion collisions. So you have a number of accelerators colliding heavy ions, such as gold gold ions, right? So they're stripped of electrons, right? And then then uh, they 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 collided. LHC runs such a program, um, not all the time. So usually LHC is colliding protons and protons, but uh, every run there is one month dedicated to collisions of heavy ions. Uh, they collide lead. Um, uh, in Brookhaven in the United States, there is this accelerator which is known as a relativistic heavy ion collider. And this was an operation from 2001. And it collides gold and gold. And maybe because US is more rich, I mean, no, they collide gold rather than lead. But uh, yeah, so um, uh, yeah, you, it's, not, it's not entirely a joke. I mean, knowing the US, I mean, I used to live in the US for 10 years. So actually, then they built RIC. I think there was a congressional inquiry why, how much gold they're going to, <laughs> to use. You know, to, right, so but, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, sometimes it's curious. So anyway, so, so they collide, right? So you have this, for example, lead lead a collision, right? So it's about 200 nucleons, right, together. But as a result of this collision, uh, it creates this um, uh, uh, highly dense and hot uh, state of nuclear matter. Um, and uh, uh, the constituents, so after the collision, it hadronizes, so all this stuff flies out. And what flies out is much more than, than, than was initially in, right? So what you got is about 10 to 20,000 hadrons flying out of the collision of the collision region as a result, all right? So this is a multi body, so it's a many body quantum, strongly interacting quantum system. Now here is one of these uh, 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 trackers uh, uh, at 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 Rick, and um, uh, here is a picture of what is happening. So we you collide these these ions. Of course, the Lorentz contracted, right? So they they move almost with the speed of light. So these are pancakes, uh, uh, basically not not spheres. They collide, right? And then they form something which is known as quark gluon plasma. This quark gluon plasma. Uh, uh, undergoes rapid uh, uh, hydrodynamic expansion, which is described by relativistic Navier-Stokes equations, and then it hadronizes, and then in, and it goes to this freeze-out state with all the hadrons flying out, right? So that's about 20,000 hadrons. So the time scales involved are microscopic, of course. It's about 10 to minus 24 seconds, right? But uh, still, there is a time scale involved, right? And this time scale, so if you forget about this tiny number and just operate in terms of T star, you will see that, um, you know, the time scale involves something like uh, two T star, three T star, six and 10 T star, right? So it means that if you think of rescale, think of this in terms of hour, right? So something happened within one hour or something is happening within 10 hours, right? So clearly there is a difference, right? So, so people can actually, can actually distinguish between these stages. All right, so here is another picture of how, like cartoon of how, how, this, how this happens, right? So that's the same uh, type. So what we need to describe is theoretically. So of course, uh, most important thing is to describe it experimentally and, and experimentalists were fantastic and they managed to track this basically event by event. So there are billions of these collisions, right? And they, they, they track uh, the hadrons flying out in every single event, right? With all, measuring all their properties uh, such as momenta and, and, and various other properties of these particles. So it's quite fantastic, but I'm a theorist. I'm a humble, uh, yeah. So I'm trying to at least say uh, something reasonable about, about this, right? So with uh, all respect to our friends, the experimentalists, right? So this is, not my, uh, my job to kind of describe these detectors. So uh, uh, theoretically speaking, what we need, right? So we need to describe this plasma firewall, right? So which is expanding and it's described by relativistic fluid dynamics, which means relativistic Navier-Stokes. Now we need to do, uh, we need to know thermodynamics, which means equations of state of, of QCD, right? Which describes this nuclear matter. And also kinetics, which means uh, transport coefficients such as viscosity. But we want to know all of this in the regime of intermediate coupling, because if you um, 
if you uh, look at the energy scale at which these collisions are taking place, then you discover that the QCD coupling constant is not small at all. It's a further one. You cannot describe, uh, you cannot apply perturbation theory uh, directly. And this is a, this is of course a limitation to this. So, so here is a picture which you get from lattice QCD. So static properties you can actually get from, uh, from, uh, from lattice and this is very good. So lattice QCD tells us what happens to nuclear matter if you heat it up, right? So, um, uh, uh, so here is the temperature on the horizontal scale in terms of this so-called critical temperature. And uh, on the vertical scale, it's the energy density of nuclear matter normalized by ideal gas uh, 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 energy density, all right? So you can see there is a sharp rise around T equal to TC. This TC is of order uh, about 200, 106, 170 MeV. So this, uh, this, this region of TC, right? But you can see a very sharp rise. So this is not a phase transition, strictly speaking. This is known as a crossover, but nonetheless, it's quite distinct. So it's known as confinement, the confinement phase transition in nuclear matter. All right, so uh, <clears throat> this transition is a crossover. If you add a little bit density, right? So a little bit of density, then it becomes actually a phase transition. And I must mention, especially for young generation, uh, um, um, uh, the fact that, uh, so we have this LHC experiments and we have RIC experiments, but there are two other accelerators coming online in the next several years. One of them is in Darmstadt in Germany and it's called FAIR. And the second accelerator is in Russia in Dubna. Uh, uh, it's known as Nika. So Nika and FAIR will look at the region of phase diagram of QCD, which deals with more dense nuclear matter. All right. So, uh, and they will look for something which is known as a critical point of nuclear matter, right? So, uh, similar in properties as a, a critical point of water, for example, right? So if you have a certain pressure and temperature, right? So, so this, is, this is what is going to happen in the next uh, two, three, four, five years, perhaps they will start operations with new accelerators. So, okay, so you have this, um, you have this uh, uh, a crossover and um, then you want to, so uh, you, you, you want to, to theoretically describe what is happening. Now, let me remind you what we know about quantum field theories at finite temperature and density in general, right? So you can kind of divide all the properties of such theories in two large groups. Uh, one would be equilibrium properties, and that means uh, equation of state, pressure, uh, speed of sound, um, uh, things which are static, right? They don't, don't involve uh, any real-time processes. Okay, and the second group uh, will be non-equilibrium or near equilibrium processes. And this involves transport coefficients or emission rates from, for example, you want to know how many pions are flying out of this plasma per unit time, things like that. So they involve time dependent processes. Now, equilibrium properties can be investigated either perturbatively using perturbative QCD at finite temperature and density, there is a huge machinery to do it. This is rather non-trivial. It's much more difficult than to do it at zero temperature, I must say. But nonetheless, this machinery exists. And, uh, or you can do it non-perturbatively. You can do it on a lattice, as I just demonstrated with, uh, with uh, pressure, right? You can, you can use lattice to, to, uh, to, um, to get these uh, uh, properties when the coupling is sufficiently strong. And this is all fine. But if you come to non-equilibrium processes, you can only perturbative approach available. And this is related to kinetic theory, right? So there's a giant building of kinetic theory starting from Maxwell Boltzmann of 19th century and then other great people of the 20th century. So kinetic theory, but it's important to understand that kinetic theory is perfectly fine as long as you have sufficiently dilute system. So you can compute viscosity of air via kinetic theory theoretically rather easily, but there is no way you can compute viscosity of water using kinetic theory, right? So you can measure it, that's fine, but you cannot compute it theoretically because it's not a dilute system anymore, right? So kinetic theory doesn't apply to water. Sometimes surprisingly that people don't really uh, realize a simple fact, right? So, so uh, if I want to, and, and this uh, uh, quark gluon plasma is not a dilute system at all, all right? So you are facing with this question of which method to use to say at least something about, let's say, transport coefficients of this of this uh, of this state of matter. Okay, so this is where this holographic duality uh, helps. So let me talk about this uh, specific quantity, which is known as shear viscosity. 
right? So shear viscosity can be understood as measure of internal friction in liquid or gas, right? So suppose you have two layers of gas or liquid, uh, one is uh, moving faster, so the top layer moving faster, the, <coughs> the one at the bottom is moving slower, right? But um, so you can imagine that, uh, you know, you have this pound, right? And one is moving faster than the other. So um, uh, the particles in both these layers are free to move in all directions. In particular, they can, they can, they can, they can also move horizontally. And if they move horizontally, uh, they transfer uh, uh, horizontal, uh, sorry, if they move vertically, they transfer horizontal momentum together with them, right? So you can think of this problem, like suppose you have two trains uh, moving with slightly different uh, speeds, and then you have people on top of each train and they jump you know, from one train to the other, right? So uh, in the uh, idealized situation, these people will, ev these jumps will eventually equilibrate velocities of two trains, right? Because they, they transfer. So if, if somebody comes, for example, from this faster layer, so this guy, right? Uh, uh, this guy will bring uh, a faster horizontal velocity to the lower layer and speed it up, right? And, and vice versa. So eventually these, um, uh, these speeds will, the speeds of these layers will equilibrate. So. The uh, viscosity, the shear viscosity, right? You have shear here, right? So the shear viscosity is the quantitative way to measure how deeply uh, particles of one layer penetrate in into the particles of the other layer, right? So and 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 uh, this quantitative um, uh, coefficients, right? So it can be computed from microscopic uh, theory underlying this motion, right? So this viscosity is no different from uh, it's a friction, right? So it's no different from the heat when you feel like this, right? So, so you have some particles of one foam penetrating particles of other foam, right? And you move like this, right? You generate heat, you can feel it, right? So that, that's a similar phenomenon. It's a dissipative real time process. All right, so uh, now let's compute, right? So what we know about viscosity of uh, gases and, and uh, uh, liquids. Uh, well, it's actually a, a rather, a rather cute, right? So if you look at history of this and, um, so Maxwell was the first one to actually compute viscosity uh, of, of, of a gas, right? So he found that it is independent, theoretically, right? So he found it's independent of pressure. He found that it scales the square of the temperature and inversely proportional to cross-section of interaction of particles, right? And the fact that it was independent of pressure, it was actually known before him, uh, but he, he was unaware of these experiments. And he was so surprised uh, that he, he didn't believe his calculation. He, he wrote to, well, I forgot, uh, maybe to Lord Kelvin. I mean, one of his guys who was a kind of a giant. So he wrote a letter uh, saying that, well, I did this calculation. It seems to be that, uh, you know, viscosity is independent of pressure. I don't know, what do you think? And, 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 uh, and, and he wrote back, oh, this is nonsense, it's impossible, right? So just, you know, throw away your... <laughs> but uh, Maxwell uh, didn't throw away his calculation he decided to check them experimentally. And that was a golden age when, you know, being the top theorist also <laughs> implied that you could do experiment. He did measure, he did measure viscosity uh, in the attic of his home, right? And uh, his wife uh, uh, served as an assistant, as a lab assistant to in this measurement. So if you ever been to Cambridge, um, uh, they have this in uh, Cavendish, uh, Cavendish laboratory, right in the, in the new building, they have this museum uh, which is quite impressive. So they, they have the actual apparatus that Maxwell used in, in this viscosity measurement. And he confirmed that his formula was right. right? So that, that's a, quite, a, quite a curious story. Anyway, so that was for gases, right? So for liquids, the situation is, was far more complicated. There is a phenomenological theory due to Frenkel in 1926, which uh, is, uh, is phenomenological. It's not, uh, it's not a fundamental theory. So, um, so things are rather difficult, right? So, so now let's, let's come to this question. So what I, I'm claiming that, that this duality, this holographic duality, this rabbit duck duality is actually capable of uh, uh, computing uh, shear viscosity and other transport coefficients, at least in some liquids, strongly interacting liquids, not in water, I cannot do water, but, but we, can complain, uh, we can compute this in some liquids, but compute analytically. Right. So um, because of this duality dictionary, we will be talking about eigenmodes of black hole. Oh, sorry, you somehow got muted, I think. Mute? Is it? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's okay. problem. Yeah, okay, something. Right. So um, in equilibrium, right, a, 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 a thermodynamic system is characterized by a collection of global charges, right? The total energy, total 
uh, electric charge, total angular momentum, and so on. If you perturb a non-gravitational system, like a spring pendulum here, it will oscillate with eigenfrequencies, normal modes, which characterize the system, right? In this case, this eigenfrequency is very simple, right? It's just a, right? So, and these are normal modes, which are known to exist. So for every single body, right? You can think of, you disturb it from equilibrium, right? It will, it will oscillate and, and the eigenmodes characterize the shape of geometry, the type of the matter and so on, right? So these are eigenmodes, eigenfrequencies of this system. Now, black holes are no exception. You can take a black hole and you can perturb black hole from the equilibrium, right? So suppose we have a black hole here and you consider the metric and you consider small perturbations of this metric. So suppose you take a brick or something and throw it in the black hole, right? What will happen? Well, the black hole uh, will, you know, will settle eventually in some equilibrium, system, in equilibrium state, which is characterized by a total mass, the initial mass plus the mass of a brick. But in doing so, it will, oscillate a bit, it will emit gravitational waves, right? It will not settle immediately. There will be some relaxation time. And you can actually compute how this happens, right? You can compute the spectrum of these small oscillations of, of, of black holes. So this spectrum is known as quasi-normal spectrum. And um, it actually is something which was observed in uh, this LIGO uh, experiments a few years ago uh, when you see, so you could, you could easily find on, on internet the actual spectra, right? So, and, and you will see that the, the signal, right, it has this tail, and the tail is governed by these quasi-normal modes of, 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 uh, of black holes which merge and so on. So, so this is something which is, which is known to, to exist, and theoretically it was known from 1950s, 1960s. So you can compute these, uh, these eigenmodes. Now, because you have this rabbit duck duality, our gravity system is one-to-one is one -one, in one-to-one -one correspondence with a holographically dual non-gravitational system describing quantum field theory slightly out of equilibrium, all right? So you have black hole slightly out of equilibrium and this dual non-gravitational strongly interacting quantum field theory slightly out of equilibrium. Now, in quantum field theory slightly out of equilibrium, we know that this regime is described by Navier-Stokes, by uh, hydrodynamic equation, diffusion equation, and similar things. Right, and uh, we have transport coefficients such as viscosity, diffusion constant, conductivities, and so on, which describe these these relaxation processes. Right, but we have a dictionary, one-to-one -one dictionary, and it turns out that these quantities, viscosity, and so on, they are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the spectrum, with quasi-normal spectrum of a dual black hole. So if you know the dictionary. You don't have to deal with strongly coupled theory anymore. All you have to do is to compute the spectrum. And this is very easy, relatively easy to do. Okay, so let me give you uh, one simple example uh, of uh, how this works. So um, suppose uh, every, so every system in near equilibrium, it, 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 it um, many body system, right? It will, it will propagate sound. So you can you can take a, you can take QCD you can take air you can take water you can take quark gluon plasma right so 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 there is a sound wave propagating through this now sound wave has a dispersion relation uh, which is written here right so first of all it has the linear part right which comes with uh, uh, speed of sound v s times the spatial momentum k right so that's the kind of well, the usual uh, propagation of wave with uh, the velocity v v s but it also has some part which is responsible for dumping, right? So you know that you can scream, but only some distance away people can hear you because there is non-zero viscosity of the air, right? And if not for viscosity, then you could scream and somebody in Australia can hear you, right? But unfortunately, well, maybe fortunately, that's not the case, right? So it is actually dumped and the damping coefficient is proportional to the ratio of shear viscosity to entropy density, all right? So uh, fine, so this, is, this just follows from hydrodynamics. It's, it's very general. Now look at eigenmode of a dual black hole. So this is a genuine calculation of five dimensional black hole, all right? Now uh, it has this frequency, the eigenmode, and you can compare term by term. So the term which is linear in K is supposed to be speed of sound in this plasma dual to this black hole. Well. The conclusion is that the speed of sound is speed of light divided by the square root of three, all right? Now, you, then you compare the dumping coefficient 
And the dumping coefficient here is one over six pi t, and it has to be compared to this one. And it tells you that the viscosity entropy ratio is equal to one over four pi in units of H bar and K Boltzmann. All right. And you can, you can actually, you can actually uh, make more and more calculations along, along the same, along the same way. Okay. So this is how it works, right? So you, you have a holographic dictionary, which allows you to extract non-perturbative information of in the quantum field theory via dual black hole description. Okay, in particular viscosity. So this is an example uh, uh, of one of the plasmas, uh, uh, some uh, 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 young Mills, uh, particular young uh, gauge theory. It's not QCD, but particular gauge theory, where you can actually do these calculations uh, for shear viscosity to entropy density. So uh, this plot shows how this uh, uh, quantity depends on the coupling. So it actually it's rather large at weak coupling. And this follows from Boltzmann equation. So this can be easily, easily, even from Maxwell theory, if you forget about this log, this log is a little bit, uh, is a little bit uh, uh, difficult to get. But, but in Maxwell theory, you can immediately predict that uh, eight over S go, scales as one over lambda squared. Okay. Now uh, at strong coupling, some years ago, it was completely unknown what this, uh, what this quantity will, how this quantity will behave. And holographic duality allows you to actually do calculations in this regime. And the result is that it is one of a pi in the units H bar is to one and Boltzmann, K Boltzmann is to one. Plus a small correction, which goes like one over lambda, the coupling constant to power of three half. Okay. So then you can probably conjecture that there is a smooth interpolation between these two limits, but this is what holography tells you. Now, what is more surprising is that holography also tells you that this initial coefficient, so of course, of course, this, this is an infinite series, right? So here, and it is this infinite series is different for, uh, uh, for, for different substances, right? It's different from, uh, for water, for this uh, QCD, for Young Mills uh, theory of this type and, and so on. But, but the holographic calculation revealed one uh, rather unexpected fact that yes, this infinite series is different for different systems, but the first term in the series happens to be universal for all of them. It is equal to one over pi, regardless. So once you have a, a, a theory for which you know to have a gravity dual, then it is guaranteed that this expansion starts with one over pi. And then other terms, such as this one, uh, are not universal. They are specific to the specific theory. Okay. So there is some universality of the shear viscosity. And people, when people uh, uh, looked at this, they thought, okay, so in heavy ion collisions, we don't have any benchmark to compare with theoretically, right? So we have measurements of, for example, the shear viscosity in direct measurements, but uh, we have no theoretical prediction for QCD because QCD is strongly coupled. There is no way to calculate in QCD in strong coupling regime of transport coefficient, right? So let's take this universal quantity of one of pi and see if how close it comes to the experimental results. And uh, here is one plot that you can see that, uh, so, so these, these dots uh, are experimental measurements. So this is uh, uh, one of the quantities which I don't want to discuss in detail, but, but this is experimental result. And the experimental results are parameterized by the value of the shear viscosity to entropy density, right? So you can see that if this ratio is very small, then you have a, a green curve which overshoots this experimental results, right? So then what you can do, you can, you can uh, increase the ratio of eight over S just by hand, right? And see which, uh, which value will actually be closer to, to experiment, right? And uh, this shows that uh, this one over four pi uh, uh, prediction of holographic duality is actually very close. So this is a red curve. Uh, it, it's actually quite close to, quite close to experiment. So, uh, so it, it, it doesn't mean, of course, that this is a direct prediction for QCD, but it's rather curious that we have this holographic calculation that that, that are not very far from, uh, so perturbative, I mean, naive perturbative calculation would give a difference of order of magnitude or more, right? And, and here it is not. So then let me mention uh, in, in the conclusion, right? So let me mention one uh, curious um, uh, conjecture, which, is, um, which came out of these, uh, of these discussions of these um, uh, uh, holographic calculations. So you may notice that, uh, okay, so we have, 
uh, we have this uh, ratio of a to the s in units of h bar for po, uh, for pi k Boltzmann, right? And um, uh, you may wonder uh, what's the value of this a to the s uh, 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 quantity for normal liquids, water, for example, or, or hydrogen liquid, hydrogen or 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 nitrogen or something like that, right? So. So you can uh, you can easily find the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the answer to this question, and uh, you will see that uh, for most substance or so all the substance we know, um, uh, this a to the rest uh, ratio has this parabolic shape. So there is a minimum. Typically, there is a minimum of this quantity somewhere, right? And uh, in units of this uh, quantity, right? This minimum. I mean, how low they can they can they can go, right? Uh, how low? So, for example, for xenon, right, it's 84 times this value, right? And for krypton, it's 57. The smallest value is liquid helium, right, uh, which is 8.8, .8, all right? And quark gluon plasma is actually close to 1.5 or maybe less, right? Or maybe 1.1, 1.2. So, quark gluon plasma is so sometimes you can hear some headlines and so on that this is the most ideal fluid found and so on right the most perfect fluid and that what they mean that what the journalists mean when they write this is precisely this that quark gluon plasma in terms of viscosity entropy ratio comes the lowest of the known substances in nature so far right maybe tomorrow somebody discovers some something which has even lower value but so far that's how it is experimental Okay, and 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 this bound was provided by by holographic calculation, so that that generated quite a bit of interest. Yeah, so you can see these other. I mean, I just flash these pictures for other substances, so you can see you can see them in more in more detail. And there are some other experiments. So, okay, then okay. So uh, if you allow me, maybe two minutes more, uh, then um, let me just say a more recent right. So this viscosity bound. The uh, story was uh, already pretty, a fairly old one. It's uh, about 15 years old and so on. But um, uh, uh, the, um, uh, there are more recent uh, developments. Uh, so one of them is um, the study of applicability of a hydrodynamic description in general, right? So you know that, of course, hydrodynamics, as we discussed already, right, it's, it's, it has some limitations, right? So clearly, the closer you come to microscopic structure of, of, of your medium, right, then, then you don't expect hydrodynamic equations to, to, to work adequately. But the question is, what exactly is the, where, where, is, it, where is the limitation, right? Where, where does it come from? And what exactly uh, is the domain of applicability of, let's say, Navier-Stokes equations in the relativistic domain, right? So again, you, holography can be used as a theoretical laboratory to answer such questions. And it turns out, it seems, that uh, the domain of applicability of hydrodynamics actually is coupling dependent. So if you have a system which is weakly coupled, there is a domain of applicability which is smaller than the domain of applica applicability of hydra at strong coupling. So when you come to strongly coupled systems, it seems that sometimes you expect hydra to work uh, when you typically wouldn't expect it to work. All right, so that, that, is, that is a philosophical conclusion of this. And moreover, sometimes it works in the situations when you don't even have local thermal equilibrium, right? If you open textbooks, right, you discover that, oh, they talk, well, we start with local thermal equilibrium and then we, we write down the your stocks and so on. It seems that this is not really necessary, okay? So there is this interesting uh, development of the recent five years or so, right? And uh, this is a final slide before conclusions. Um, you may ask another question, a very simple question. So you have this, I showed this uh, 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 sound uh, uh, dispersion relation, right? For the, for the sound, right? The speed of sound times the momentum, then there is a dumping and, and so on, right? So in, in principle, this is an infinite series in momentum K, right? So it's a, it's a function which is expanded in infinite series. Now, you may wonder uh, what is the nature of this series? Is it convergent? Is it divergent? Is it asymptotic series? What, uh, what is the radius of convergence? Things like that, right? So again, by conventional means, it's rather difficult to investigate these questions. But if you, with holographic dictionary, if you transfer this to the behavior of the eigenmodes, the quasi-normal spectra of the dual black holes, then it becomes almost trivial. 
almost trivial. So you can you can look, and it's actually a rather beautiful picture. So you look at the spectra in the domain of complex momentum, right? So you remember that if you have a series, right, in order to investigate convergence, so what is the obstacle to convergence of the series, right? Typically, there is some singularity sitting somewhere in a complex plane, right? So if you only treat your uh, variable Q as a real variable, right, you may not notice this at all. So think of a function one divided by one plus Q squared, right? You expand this series, it has a radius of convergence one, but if you only stick to Q squared <laughs> Q, a real, a real variable, right? You would never understand where is the, what, what's the obstacle, what's, what's wrong, right? And, and of course, what's wrong is the singularities at plus minus I, right? Sitting on the imaginary axis, right? So if you never knew about complex variables, you would never guess that what, right? So, uh, so by, by, uh, by transferring this to this quasi-normal mode story, you can actually uh, look at the behavior of the spectra in the complex domain of Q, right? And this is, has a relation with algebraic properties of algebraic curves. So you can see there is this uh, place where this algebraic curve opens up, so to speak, and this serves as an obstacle to the radius of convergence. So we can compute the radii, uh, radii, radii of convergence of hydrodynamic series by using this holographic dictionary and therefore say something about the domain of applicability of the hydrodynamic description of the system. All right, so, <clears throat> so this is the end. So uh, let me just conclude uh, by saying that, um, so we, we, we saw, I hope that string theory was at least partially successful in explaining the bekenstein hawking entropy of black holes, the stromage Waffa work and, and, and subsequent work after them. Now black holes have entropy and temperature and behave like thermodynamic systems. And we think we understand why because of the holographic principle, they are described by non-gravitational degrees of freedom, right? And, and we can count them, right? And, and, and they give us the thermodynamic uh, answers. Now, um, uh, the work of string theorists uh, on black hole physics has led to the rather accidental, I must say, discovery of this ADS-CFT or holographic duality. And this duality can be viewed as a non-trivial change of variables in path integral. We know it works. All right, it, was been, it has been tested in numerous examples, but uh, it remains a conjecture. It's rigorous proof of this is still lacking, but people, people use it because there is no kind of, only one example is enough to disprove it, right? And nobody found it in 25 years, so I think. Well, it, it's not, I mean, from point of view of mathematician, of course, this, not, this is nothing, right? So of course it's, you know, yeah. But physicists are maybe less rigorous. Now, uh, gauge string duality uh, uh, can compute field uh, theory quantities as strong coupling, right? So we saw viscosity and so on. And these computations help to explain properties of quark gluon plasma, this low shear viscosity entropy density ratio that heavy ion people were extremely happy to see and uh, are of great interest uh, for other strong interacting systems. Now, uh, let me conclude with one sentence and um, um, uh, that is that duality, right? So this rabbit duck story, right? It's a two-way street, right? You have a dictionary. So in principle, so most of the time so far, it was used one way, right? So you want to get some uh, uh, information about strongly interacting quantum field theory, you use dual gravity, right? But of course it's a dictionary. So in principle, you should be able to go the other way, right? And understand strongly coupled gravity via dual uh, quantum field theory, which is weakly coupled, right? And I must say that uh, there was only a handful of uh, uh, serious papers on this matter. So this is an open question and perhaps one of you may, may contribute to this in the future. Okay, thank you very much, so I will stop. Thank you very much, Professor. This was really, really interesting. Um, <clears throat> so everyone who has questions, put them in the group chat now. Uh, and uh, I'll, get, I'll get the question started. So, you told us that the quark gluon plasma can be studied using uh, relativistic fluid mechanics. Yes. And that's precisely because it's strongly coupled. And you told us afterwards that uh, the applicability of strong coupling is like way more than weak coupling. Is that correct? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, no. Uh, one can apply relativistic hydrodynamics uh, generically. So the equations. The yeah. equations of relativistic hydrodynamics are completely universal and they are coupling independent. Okay. But um, what depends on coupling is, uh, so, so basically hydrodynamics is an effective theory where you have uh, universal equations yeah. uh, with non-universal coefficients, such as for example, viscosity, mm -hmm. right? 
So uh, let's say Navier Stokes, uh, it doesn't matter relativistic or not, right? So even non-relativistic, right? So Navier Stokes equations, which describe uh, behavior of water and behavior of air in this room are exactly the same. What yeah. difference what difference are the values of, of transport coefficients? And um, transport coefficients, you can either input by hand by measuring them, right? And this is, uh, I mean, if you think of uh, uh, solving the VS stocks in uh, uh, aerospace industry, right? They, they, they do it all the time, right? They, they test all these plane models and so on. Of course, they don't, uh, they don't, they don't bother to calculate, right? So, so they just they just measure these things, right? And mm -hmm. in fact, they have very extensive uh, knowledge of. Uh, uh, yeah, let me let me tell you brief, very briefly one. So at some point when we were uh, working on this, uh, we wanted to. Um, so there are two viscosities. One is called shear viscosity, and then there is something which is called bulk viscosity. Now, bulk viscosity is not so easy to find in terms of tables and so on, right? And at some point, we wanted a, a complete table of bulk viscosities with various substances, and we couldn't uh, we couldn't find them. That was in the U.S. At, uh, about 15 years ago, and then somebody had an idea. So um, they called uh, they called the uh, the Air Force, the Pentagon, right? And and they just asked, uh, you know, do, do you happen to have any you know, bulk viscosity? And say, of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so thankfully, it wasn't anything classified, right? So we got the, the so the, the best source of bulk viscosity is actually <laughs> the Pentagon, right? <laughs> and 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 it's 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 completely it's completely understandable why, right? Because they practically they deal all with all the time with with objects flying, um, you know, at at, uh, at uh, enormous speeds, the, the missiles and so on. They they have to know these things because now we have stocks, right? So they have to put it by hand, right, in the in the equations and solve them. So uh, yeah, so so relativistic hydrodynamics applies universally, but uh, transport coefficients uh, sometimes are impossible by convention uh, to compute by conventional means. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Um, we're getting some questions. So first off, Carol asks, how do you define a quantum field theory in a flat space background with a finite temperature? Does uh -huh. that go by making specific assumptions about the equations of state which enter the energy momentum tensor? That's that's a good question. Uh, yes. Um, uh, so uh, yeah. So um, it is defined in the following way. So it's no different uh, from how you consider a many-body quantum system in non-relativistic, for example, domain, mm -hmm. right? So uh, let me remind you how, how it goes. Like, so you have something which is called a density matrix, right? And um, uh, then you, um, uh, uh, your, uh, your system is, uh, uh, so if it is, a, if, if it is a many body system in thermal equilibrium, it is characterized by the density matrix, which goes like, so rho is called rho. So it's rho e to the minus uh, beta h, where beta is inverse temperature and h is your Hamiltonian. All right, so <clears throat> relativistic or not, it doesn't matter. So it could be quantum field theory, it could be uh, just Bose gas uh, for non-relativistic particles, but uh, it's it's a, it's a, it's a many-body system, right? A quantum quantum many-body system. So then, what happens? So once you know this uh, density uh, matrix operator rho, right? It, 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 it's a base equation, it's called Bloch equation, but uh, then you can compute. So you are interested in expectation values of various operators, like the expectation values at a given state. So uh, when, when, when rho is equal to one, right, it's a trivial uh, density matrix, you have a zero temperature quantum field theory, right? So then you just compute expectation value of uh, operator O in the usual way, just uh, uh, sandwiches uh, yeah. in, in, in a particular state, right? And then, so if you have rho, you do exactly the same, but now you sandwich you sandwich uh, rho times O, right? So, so the expectation value of operator O is density matrix times this uh, operator O and it is sandwiched in, so you compute a trace, you compute trace and this, this sandwich means computing the trace of rho times O, okay? So now the only difference, so, so you can do it, um, uh, in fact, I mean, the simplest way to kind of convince yourself that this is what is happening, right, is to do this computation for relativistic ideal gas, so for example, for, for, for black body radiation, right? So 
So where uh, in this case, you can analytically compute everything, right? You can, you can, yeah, so this is very simple, very simple computation. Now, uh, if you have interacting system, of course, then, then things becomes less, less trivial. Um, now in relativistic quantum field theory, you do exactly the same, right? You have this trace rho e to the minus beta h, where h is the Hamiltonian of your quantum field theory, relativistic Hamiltonian. Now, a very convenient way of doing the computation is to present this trace of rho e to the, e to the minus beta h in the form of a path integral. And it is a non-trivial step. It has something to do with the fact that, uh, you know, you have this uh, uh, rho e is equal to e, e to the minus beta h, right? And this looks pretty much like evolution operator, e right. to the minus yeah. i yeah. divided by h bar times the Hamiltonian, right? Uh, the only thing this beta serves as an imaginary, uh, like it's uh, this inverse temperature is an imaginary time. Mm. Right? So there is something, so this formalism has been developed uh, throughout 20th century. And uh, in fact, the most complete version of this formalism is known as Schwinger-Keldish, uh, Schwinger-Keldish uh, Schwinger uh, path integral uh, approach to, 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 to these computations, right? So, so this is how you define uh, quantum field theory. So if you're talking about equilibrium quantum field theory, you can basically uh, see that, you can basically say that this is usual quantum field theory but uh, consider it at uh, imaginary time, right? So in Euclidean, that means Euclidean quantum field theory, but imaginary time has to be wrapped on a circle of radius beta because you are computing the trace of e to the minus beta h, right? So you consider quantum field theory on a cylinder uh, where you have uh, infinite uh, uh, spatial dimensions, free spatial dimensions, and time dimension in Euclidean space is wrapped on a cylinder of, of, of radius beta. Okay, very interesting. Uh, and I think we have one more question from Yorios. Uh, he says, you mentioned the transition in the quark gluon plasma between confinement and non-confinement. Is there an interpretation of the dual transition in the black hole realm of that phenomenon? Yeah, very good question. Yes, that, that's, that's, that's very good. So um, now uh, the answer is yes. Um, so in black hole physics, uh, there is something which is known as Hawking page phase transition. And uh, it is completely, it's, you know, that was before any duality or anything, right? So, so, so this is, a, uh, so basically um, you, can, um, uh, you can think of this as a, um, as a uh, as a following, so you can um, you can look at um, you can look at the free energy um, of uh, uh, black holes of the uh, so so I mean you have entropy which is Bekenstein Hawking entropy right but you can also think about free energy or oh, okay so forget about free energy let's say just entropy right so <clears throat> so you can, um, um, uh, in usual thermodynamics, right? You, you know that uh, you, uh, you have a stable thermodynamic equilibrium if energy reaches maximum, right? So if you have some parameter, right? So then you maximize your entropy and you see uh, which uh, configuration, for example, which phase actually has a maximum entropy, right? So Hawking page uh, is, is a similar situation. So you may have, uh, depending on the temperature, and uh, actually not the temperature, but the, um, the, uh, the, the product of the temperature times the radius because it has to be dimensionless uh, uh, parameter. So depending on this parameter, you may have the situation in which a black hole is, has a maximal entropy or a, a different situation in which it is just a, 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 a thermal gas without black holes. So it's just a Euclidean, so this Euclidean space-time wrapped on a cylinder, but without black holes in them, right? Completely regular space-time. Mm. Uh, so depending on this parameter, uh, which means depending on the temperature or the size of black hole, right? Uh, it, it may be that one phase or the other uh, 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 dominates, right? And uh, uh, this, this is known as, uh, as Hawking-Page transition. And this is one to one in one-to-one -one correspondence with confinement to confinement phase transition uh, in, so that, 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 that has been studied in uh, almost immediately after ADS-CFT was formulated in 
1997. There was this paper by Witten in 1998, specifically about this uh, this story. Right? So, yes. Okay. Um, does anyone have any other questions? To just I've got one, a uh, pretty simple one, I guess. Uh, so, in one of the slides, uh, you mentioned that uh, a, a, a d-dimensional, uh, I think, field theory can be mapped to uh, a non-gravitational system, or, or the other way, I think. Maybe a gravitation system in d minus one dimensions, right? Yes. Yes. What, yeah. What, that's what would that mean for? What would that mean for d equals one then? So what's a zero dimensional? Uh, uh, um, uh, yeah. Yeah. So so so, um, uh, so zero dimensional. So this is a uh, uh, so w w when we when we uh, talk about d here, this is so this d is dimension of space and time. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, right. So, so, okay. so from that perspective, zero-dimensional situation would correspond yeah. to quantum mechanics. So this is a yeah. Um, so, um, but uh, uh, yes, I mean uh, it's true that um, I mean one of the beauties of the holography is is that uh, it is uh, so in any dimension you can have these pairs, right? So of course we are mostly interested in three plus one dimensional uh, normal systems, right? And then the duals would have uh, w w would be five dimensional, for example, black holes, right? So, uh, but uh, you can go lower, right? You can, you can say, well, uh, um, you can study theories. Um, actually, that was a, a subject of intense, rather intense and interesting study. So theories in condensed matter, because this has kind of interesting applications in condensed matter in general. So suppose you have two plus one dimensional uh, uh, flat, uh, non-gravitational system, right? So in condensed matter, mm -hmm. such systems are of interest. Then uh, the dual to 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 such a uh, to such a system will be three plus one dimensional gravity, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so 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 that uh, that that is uh, yes. And and uh, uh, other examples. So for example, you have uh, one plus one dimensional uh, 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 one plus one dimensional non-gravitational theories. Now the dual uh, to them will be two plus one. Uh, dimensional gravity, which is a very special Chern-Simons type uh, uh, gravity, which is well known, is well known, and it's pretty. Actually, in in the last two three years, that was a very interesting area of uh, research, is uh, related to the so-called uh, SYK uh, model, where you can yeah you can you can do a lot of non-perturbative calculations without holography, and then compare with holographic calculations. I see. Okay. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? There's one in the chat. In the chat. Uh, oh yeah. Oh, sorry. One sec. Uh, okay. This is from uh, Radek. Uh, is there a perspective for potentially being able to apply this for predictions of uh, hadronization of the LHC, or are we too far away from the thermodynamical equilibrium and in that regime? Uh, uh, so. Um, uh, 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 one, uh, so uh, let me rephrase it perhaps in, in the following way. So which, um, um, so which exactly, which predictions or what, what, uh, what variables do we want to, do we want to compute, right? So uh, one, I mean, one question which, which has been addressed in, in holography is uh, actually a rather simple one. It's a question of multiplicity, right? So when I, when I said that you, you collide with heavy ions, right? So, and, they they contain they contain a number of protons and neutrons initially, right? We well know how many, but uh, what comes out depends on the energy of the collision, right? So I said that the number of particles is uh, of the order of twenty thousand, but uh, one um, uh, simple question is: Can you predict how many particles will be actually born as a result? As a function of the collision energy in the center of mass frame S, right? So that that's that's a rather that's called the question of multiplicity, and um, uh, holography. Uh, actually, this is a rather painful issue, right? So because, um, yeah, I mean, holography doesn't deal with QCD itself, and uh, in in that in that that sense, it's 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 rather difficult. But people were trying to do this, uh, not terribly successfully, I must say. Uh, the first question, the first people who addressed the issue of multiplicity were Fermi and uh, Landau separately. Uh, so Fermi at the end of 1940s, I think, and then Landau uh, several years later, uh, 
So of course, uh, starting his uh, Landau started his paper with a characteristic uh, remark that yeah, Fermi tried to do it, but he did it all wrong. So now, <laughs> so, and uh, in fact, it, that was uh, that was actually a correct remark. But um, anyway, so Landau has a prediction for this um, exponent for multiplicity. Uh, which is still better than the prediction from holography, I must confess. So, so, so it's um, uh, yeah, it's a difficult uh, yeah, it's a difficult uh, uh, variable to to deal with because we don't have a holog holography dual to QCD itself. Right. Okay. Any more questions? I guess that's it. So, yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor. This was really, really interesting. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I hope. So thank you. I hope it was useful, right? And it was very lovely to see you all. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, yeah, thanks. Just quickly, um, mm -hmm. an announcement for everyone who's still in the event. There is an event tomorrow at 8 p.m. Um, with Professor Mason Porter. We're talking about opinion models and social influence on networks. And then if there are any students of the university, next week we have a revision session online. Um, and then you can find our term card and all the events on Facebook. So make sure to not forget to check. And a big thanks again to Professor Andre for the talk. Um, all right. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. See you. Bye.